All right, this morning I'm going to break from the Colossians series and go with tradition on uh, Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry. Thousands of churches across the world will be celebrating Palm Sunday and will be, pre uh, be preaching on the triumphal entry. Now, I titled this message, this triumphal entry, question mark. Is it a triumphal entry? It can be, and it may not be. You'll have to decide this morning as we work our way through this. This is a journey from Jesus from Bethany to Jerusalem. Their shouts were empty that day. Before the week is over, the people will be shouting, crucify him. They waited for the promise of the kingdom, and they wanted a promise of the kingdom without the cross. They wanted the benefits that God offered, such as peace, prosperity, no war, and what have you. But they didn't want the cross. They wanted material ple pleasing, and they would admit that Jesus was the Son of Man, but they wouldn't admit that he was the Son of God. They want a king without repentance. And so in John eleven fifty three we read, So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. That was the thought of the leaders of Jerusalem, the leaders of Israel. So let's take the last journey of Christ to Jerusalem and the purpose of that journey. You may be interested to know that that journey didn't just begin at Bethany, a few uh, steps or half a mile from the temple. That journey began up at Galilee as he met his last and final message. We're going to do a little jumping around in the Bible, so uh, bear with us. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 17 and following. Matthew chapter 20. And Jesus clearly states the purpose of his last voyage to Jerusalem. <clears throat> Matthew 20, verse 17. As Jesus was about to go to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside by themselves. And on the way he said to them, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And they will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him, and on the third day he will be raised again. The intention of his ministry or intention of his journey is given very clearly. And he has stated his purpose. Now let's take a look at the, the actual reaction of the disciples to the news that they just heard. And you turn to the book of Mark. It's in all four Gospels, the triumphal entry. But we'll take a little bit out of this Gospel, a little bit out of that Gospel, and try to put it together. What did the disciples think of this message? What were they going to say? Well, let's take a look. Mark Chapter 10, verse 32. They were on the road going to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed him were fearful. And again he took the twelve aside, and he began to tell them what was going to happen to him. Now the disciples knew this is a different kind of journey. Number one, Jesus is walking ahead of them. And his mind is already on what's going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem. And when he gets to Jerusalem, eventually he will be arrested and they will try him and they will kill him and crucify him on the cross. So as he's going, the disciples say and get somewhat tearful. What is going to happen here? What's going to take place? And we see the stopover at Jericho on his way. Matthew again, chapter 20. As I told you, we're going to be skipping around. But 
the stopover at Jericho, and we notice that he runs into two blind men, Bartimaeus and his friend, and he heals them in Jericho. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 29, we read, Two blind men were sitting by the road, hearing Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. These two blind men recognized that Jesus was from the son of David. Jesus was the promised Messiah. Jesus was the one who would come and rule and have peace on the earth. And when the crowd heard this, they sternly told them, don't say anything, be quiet, hush up. But these two blind men said, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Hey, they knew that Jesus could heal them. And they knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And one of the things of his kingdom, according to Isaiah 35, is that he would heal the blind. He would open their eyes and the crippled and the lame and so forth, and the deaf would hear. And so they cried out. They recognized who he was. Furthermore, in that same town, we read in Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 19, excuse me, verse 7 to 10, something else happened on that stopover at Jericho. Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and he says to them, and he said, he, there's this guy who's short. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold the Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I'll give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And Zacchaeus wanted to see the Lord, and he couldn't look over the crowd, so he climbed into the sycamore tree so he could see the Lord pass by. Now he is also called the chief of the tax collectors. Now the Roman tax collectors had a simple rule. They would give what was required of the taxes that Rome required, but the Roman said, if you can get more money than is actually required, it's yours. So a lot of cheating was going on with the tax collectors. And Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector in the city and area around Jericho. And he came to know the Lord and he cried out to him, Behold, the Lord, I, I repent, I'll give everything back that I've cheated to give it back four times. You don't hear that for the, from the IRS. But he was different. He had that change of heart. Then the Lord spells out in a parable in that same area. And we read of this parable in, uh, the, uh, way, on the way. It is about the nobleman in Luke 19.11. And we read this parable, as you look at it, you'll notice something. He lays out what's going to happen. The nobleman in this parable goes into a far country, is leaving. And there's two classes of people in this country. There are the citizens and there are the servants. And you'll notice that while he's going away for this long journey, he gives his servants ten minutes each one getting the same amount. And the citizens of that particular country of the nobleman hate the nobleman. They hate him. And the servants are rewarded when he returns, in verse 15. And the judgment on those who are professing the servants, remember the servant came back and he said, you know, uh, here's, your, here's your minute back. I didn't do anything with it. I knew you were a hard man and you, you, you took things that weren't yours. I knew you were a tough guy. So I kept it and I did nothing and here it is in return. 
It's a very simple story. Jesus is a nobleman. And Jesus is going to Jerusalem. And he's going to go to heaven. And he's going to give his servants gifts. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been given a gift. You may have been given several gifts. And it's up to us as believers to use these gifts for his honor and glory. And when he comes back, he's going to reward us. Nine of them brought back something. Various, but they brought back something. The one said, well, he's a hard task, man. I'm going to hide this particular uh, gift and give it back to him. And Jesus, or the nobleman, said, if you knew I was hard, why didn't you at least put this in the bank and let it raise some interest? That's the least you could do. And as a result, he slew the servant and put him in what we would call hell. Now, you and I are in that particular era. The Lord Jesus is not here. The Lord Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for you and I who are believers. But he is coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to reward us to how faithful we have been in the lifetime that he has given to us. My question to you is, when he comes back, and he'll come back in a triumphal entry, but when he comes back, will you receive a reward or will you be condemned to hell? That's a question. Let's not kid ourselves. God put us in this world for a purpose. He called us to salvation to be fruitful. And unfruitful men are not people who belong to God. You cannot be saved and do nothing. You can't be a child of God and do nothing about it. God has given you the Holy Spirit the impetus to do something to please him. And then there is judgment on his enemies. So he, he kind of lays out his program to the world and to his people that are following him. Then the next step in his journey, he arrives at Bethany to a greeting of the crowd. In John 12, take a, I'll just flip that, you can just listen to it. John 12, verse 9, the large crowd of the Jews, when they learned that he was there, they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see, also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. Lazarus was dead for four days. And, he, and when they were going to open the tomb, one who said, you know, he already stinketh, as the old King James says. He's already decayed. And Jesus brought him forth alive. Wow, what a miracle is that? And I'm sure if we had it today, it'd be on every face page, and it'd be viral, and it'd be all over the place. And it was in a small way in Jerusalem. Here's a man who was dead four days. Come and see him. He's alive. They came to see Jesus, but they came to see Lazarus also. So there's a large crowd there at Bethany. And while he's at Bethany, at the house of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, he says to his two disciples in Luke 19, let's take a look at that. Luke 19 and verse 29. When he approached Bethpage and Bethany, near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, what are you why are you untying it? You say, the Lord has need of it. Now Jesus, in using his omnipresence, knew what was going to happen. And when he got to Bethpage, and he was ready to go to Jerusalem, he sends two disciples ahead of him, and he says to them, You will go as you enter the city, you will see a colt. You untie that colt, and you bring it up to me. 
And the owners will say what? Why are you untying the colt? Why are you taking him from there? And, he's, and you're to say, the Lord has need of him. And we're not sure what arrangements the Lord made. But anyway, when they said the Lord has need of them, they let him go. And they bring the colt to Jesus. And then we have the royal entrance to Jerusalem. On the lowly means of entry. They brought in Matthew 11, verse 7. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And when you look at the passage of Scripture, they began to shout in John chapter 12, verse 13, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Immediately, people started to rejoice. Now, bring, sitting on a colt was prophesied many years before. In Zechariah 9.9 9, on the board you read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the full of a donkey. Now, this promise was given by Zechariah. The context is, that in this day, we have Alexander the Great has just conquered and slaughtered countries to the north of Jerusalem and Palestine. And in fear of that, the chief priests dress up and they go to meet Alexander ahead of time, a couple of them. And when they meet and greet Alexander, Alexander is impressed with these people with the Jews, with the chief priests. And so rather than going down and conquering and slaughtering the people of Israel, he passes by. He lets them go. And Zechariah says to this kingless country, Israel, he says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you He's coming, and he's coming endowed with salvation. So humble yourself. He will be humble and mounted on a donkey, even the colt, the, the foal of a donkey. Jesus is coming on a donkey the first time. The promise comes to Alexander, and, or the Zechariah about Alexander, and he changes his mind. But the Lord promises the Jews their deliverer, their Messiah will come not as a conquering king, but a lowly king mounted on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, the, the, the Israel, by the time Jesus comes, several hundred years later, when Jesus himself comes, the people were looking for a Messiah, one who would deliver them from Rome, one who would give them independence, one who would give them prosperity, one who would give them peace. They were looking for this. And so when they see this whole thing take place, they begin to shout. And they give a royal welcome. It has been estimated by historians in that day that as many as two million people gathered in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday in preparation for the Passover feast. Now some think that might be a little bit exaggerated, but there were thousands and over a million people in this city. In fact, the city prepared for it. Most of the people built a house where they had a guest room so that people coming from the Passover would be able to stay in their, in their guest room. And this crowd preceded Jesus and followed Jesus, and, having, and uh, this crowd loosed their coats, loosed their robes, spread them in front of Jesus, and he walked on it with the donkey ahead of it. Now notice in Mark 11, let's just take a look at it. Mark 11, 3 to 10. I guess it's on the board. And many spread their coats on the road. Others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the field. And <clears throat> those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom 
of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is a quote from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 was considered to be the highest messianic psalm. It was a Hillel psalm. It was a psalm people sang as they went to the Jerusalem. As they marched to Jerusalem, they would sing along as they were going to the city, to the temple, and entering it. Now they were throwing their coats, and notice what they were saying. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who come is the coming kingdom of our father David. They recognized Jesus was the Messiah. Furthermore, they are shouting Hosanna, which is the Hebrew word for the word save now. Save us now. In Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26, we read, O Lord, do save. We beseech you, O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have, we have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Save us. The word Hosanna, save now. They're shouting continually. Remember when uh, Dr. Nicodemus, doctor of theology, came to Jesus in John chapter 3? And he says, you know, what, we've seen the things you've done. Jesus, we know you have to be from God. And Jesus replies, unless a man is born again, he cannot see what? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, which is what we would call today the millennial kingdom in Revelation chapter 20, which after the Lord takes us home to be with him at the rapture of the church, then returns after the tribulation period and establishes his kingdom for a thousand years, Revelation 20, mentioned six times. When he comes back, he will have a kingdom. And the Jews were looking for that kingdom. It was promised all over the Old Testament. But Jesus says the only way into that kingdom is you have to have a spiritual rebirth. You're not in the kingdom just because you belong to Abraham. You're not in the kingdom just because you belong to some church. You're not in the kingdom just because you were baptized. You're not in the kingdom just because you made a profession in front of the church. You're in the kingdom because you repented of your sin and you gave yourself to Jesus Christ. That's what put you in the kingdom. And these people are shouting, blessed is he, save now. But they forgot part of that, part of that announcement. Take a look at math, or took a, take a look at the Psalm 118, verses 22 to 23. And part of that Psalm says this The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now, Jesus had already told them that when I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, spit upon, mocked, beat. The crowd is shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, omitting this part of that psalm. When Jesus got to Jerusalem, he told the, the, he told the chief priests and scribes, he, he, came, he came and he said, did you never read the scriptures, Matthew 21, 42 to 44, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The cornerstone is the chief stone that keeps the arch together. What holds that arch up? A stone puts in the middle, and it holds it together. Or it can be a part of the building, the cornerstone, from which you measure everything from there. Didn't you read the scriptures? I have to be here, and I am going to be rejected. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. 
And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls will be scattered like dust. The stone will be broken to pieces, but on whom it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Jesus is predicting his own death. People get it. People who are on that road did not get it. Shouting, Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Sad thing is, before the week's over, they're going to cry, crucify him. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. You're either going to follow me or not. And these are professing religious people. These are people who really know the Old Testament. These are people who are looking for a kingdom, but they don't want the cross. How many churches this morning are going to be preaching about the triumphal entry and they're going to miss the whole thing? They want all the peace and all that God can offer. But they don't want the cross. What happens when Jesus gets to the city? He arrives and he sees the consternation of the Jewish leaders. Luke 19.39 Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They're calling you the Messiah. Stop it. The Jewish leaders recognized that something new was happening in the ministry of Jesus was taking place. Hundreds and thousands of people were in that quarter praising God and shouting. I can imagine that can be heard quite a ways. Uh, having gone uh, to a Monday night football game in Kansas City and the guy I went with was always late. We always missed the first kickoff. And he had a parking place. He was a signed parking place, but it was always full. But he had a way of driving clear to the front, parking on the grass when we got in. They weren't checking cars anymore. But you know, when we got into the parking lot, we could hear the crowd of 85 to 90,000 people shouting. Can you imagine this kind of a crowd? Thousands more than 80 or 90,000 people shouting. This was heard in Jerusalem and all over the place. And the Pharisees were upset. And the jealous and sharp-eyed religious leaders of Israel had been watching every action that Christ had from the beginning and had already made up their minds they were going to kill him. The answer, to Je answer Jesus gives largely uh, challenged and challenged them. And you know, up till this time, Jesus really didn't challenge them a lot. He let his works do the challenge. But now the time had come when there could be no more silence. In Luke 19.40, Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, that's the people, the stones will cry out. If, if the people don't shout that I'm the Messiah today, coming in for the coronation, they're going to, the stones would at least say, he made us. He is the Messiah. He laments over Jerusalem in, that, in chapter Luke 19. Turn with me to Luke 19, verse 41. All right. Luke 19, chapter 41 to 44. When he approached Jerusalem... He saw the city and wept over it. So you wonder how triumphant was this entry. Saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which made for peace, but now they have become hidden from your eyes. There's a lesson to be learned here. If you don't pay attention to the word of God, God may shut that book for you, and you'll never know it. Every time you open this book, you're going to be judged for the things you read. And if you read this book, and you don't pay attention to it, 
He may shut your eyes when you never see it. And you'll never be saved. There comes a time when God ceases to deal with people. And I pray it's not that way with you. I pray that you've already received the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you haven't, you'll do it this morning. You don't have to come up here and shake my hand. In, the, in your own mind, you can repent of your sin and place your faith in Jesus Christ and say, I want to be part of the family. I want to be in that kingdom. And he says, you have known the day, even the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. Look what else he says. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and then hem you in on every side. They will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You probably heard the gospel and let it go. I don't know when the shutoff time comes, but it's going to come. So today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to repent if you haven't done so. Now, it's interesting that statement. If you had known this day, and some of you have been through this before, but let's review it. And the things which make for peace, but now you have, they have been hidden from your eyes. Turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, and verse 24. Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24. It's going to get a little complicated here. And I'm going to do my best to clear it up. But let me tell you something. If you really want to know what this prophecy is, study it. Get into the Word and learn it. My, my, my job as a pastor teacher is to challenge you about your life and your walk with Jesus Christ and to challenge you to get into the Word of God and know the Word of God thoroughly. That's my job. I can't make you do it. I can't coax you in to do it. You have to be led and guided by your own men, mind in submission to the Spirit of God. And this is one of the most unique prophecies in the Word of God. Daniel is in captivity. And Daniel has been in captivity for, uh, in, in, uh, in Babylon for almost the beginning because he was with the first wave of captives to go into Babylon. And when Nebuchadnezzar went back to Babylon, he took the sharpest of the young men. Ba uh, Nebuchadnezzar was a bright guy. And he knew that he needed bright men in his kingdom, and he needed bright men to keep the kingdom going. So he put them in, and he educated them, Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego. And Daniel says, you know what? We, we're willing to be educated, but we're going to follow our Lord, and we're not going to eat meat that isn't kosher. Feed us vegetables, feed us anything, but we're not going to eat unkoshered food. Well, if you don't, if you fail, it's on my back, the, t the professor said, but I'll try it. They ended up, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ended up passing the final test ten times further than all the rest. Now Daniel becomes a great statesman and he interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream and as a result he's given a position in the Babylonian government. Now he's been reading the prophecy in Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks, this is from Jeremiah, seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your Holy Spirit. Seventy weeks is about up. So if you read the book, you see Daniel is saying, what happens now? You've told us why it's 70 years. Now what's going to happen? How long is it going to take before your kingdom will rule and reign? 
Now let's go back to uh, a passage in Exodus chapter 23, verses 10 and 11. Where do we get this 70 weeks, and what does this 70 weeks really mean? Exodus 23, verses 10 to 11. You shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield. But on the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the needy of your people may eat whatever they leave, the beast of the field may eat. You are to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Now I find this kind of humorous a little bit. I grew up, uh, I grew up uh, with a very strict father who we never worked on Sunday. The only thing we did on Sunday was what we had to do, milk the cows and feed them, gather eggs, and go to church. It was uh, we, when we irrigated, we shut the well off on Saturday night, 1130. And then on Monday morning, 1230, we'd start the wells. Now, we did it with siphon tubes. Some of you know what that is, and most of you don't. But each row had to be put a one-inch siphon in it and put it in the row. So you'd start the well, then you'd run to the end and start all these siphons. And you had a little dam there that built up the water. And if you weren't fast enough, it'd run over or it'd run over the ditch someplace. And then you had to run back and they'd have a break in the ditch and you'd have to fill it in. It was a fun time. In the middle of the night. And I'll tell you right now, the headlights aren't like they are now. Dim. And you can wear down a battery pretty quick. Now here's the thing. Most of us understand that you don't work on Sunday if you're, uh, if you're into the Sabbath. You rest on Sabbath day, which is Saturday. Okay? Putting it on Sunday, there is no biblical warrant for taking Saturday and putting it on Sunday. Right? There's none. Now, farmers had a problem back in the days of Israel. They could rest one day, but to rest a whole year? I'll tell you right now, most farmers had trouble with that. You'd just say, okay, it's the seventh year, so we're not going to farm anything. We're going to all let all, everything that comes up will be volunteer, and the pe poor people can come and eat it, and the beasts can eat it. God looked out for the, for the uh, animals. Saw a rare thing this morning, a pheasant rooster on the way to church. Just thought you'd like to know there's still one rooster in all of Hamilton County. <laughs> but the point, of course, is that you let it rest. Now, the people of Israel were like a lot of us. They could not stand to let their farm or their ranch to be idle for a whole year. So they didn't obey it. And they hadn't done it for 490 years. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 21. I think I've got it on the board. <clears throat> for 490 years... They didn't obey that command. Those who had escaped from the sword carried away to Babylon, and they were servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord in the month of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbath. If you're not going to rest, if you're not going to rest the land, God said, I'll rest it. So you're going to spend, as Israel people, you're going to spend 70 years in Babylon while the land in Israel is vacant and fallow. What does that tell you about God? You know something? You better obey Him. You better obey God or else. It says in Galatians 6, Whatsoever a man sows, what? 
That's El Yasserib. Now, I grew up on a farm, and we grew some oats, but we didn't plant corn there because corn doesn't produce oats. What you sow is what you'll reap. And that's true in life. Really true in life, young people. Teenagers, be sure, college age kids, young people, be sure you make wise decisions, true decisions on the Word of God, because you can make bad decisions which will affect you your entire life. Think it through. What does God want you to do? Well, the children of Israel disobeyed it. And all the days of its desolation, he says in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 21, all the days of desolation, it kept Sabbath until 70 years were complete. So Daniel says, what next, really? Now notice what he says in Daniel 4, verse 27. He says, 70 weeks, or 7, 24, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make an atonement for iniquity in being in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. Now, verse 25, see so you are to know and discern that from the building or the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be built again with, mo with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. 69 weeks. Now, 70 weeks of years cause 70 years of rest without obeying God. So, you know what God does? God says to Daniel, through the angel Gabriel, I'm going to give you 490 years, and then you'll have peace. Then you'll have the millennium. But he does it in first of 62 and 7 weeks, which amounts to 69 weeks. He doesn't include the last week, the 70th week. doesn't include it. But in the 69th weeks, we read this in verse 26. After 62 plus the previous seven, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war, desolation, desolations determined. After 69 weeks, the Messiah marches from Bethany to Jerusalem, and he ends up what? Dying, and he has nothing. He's buried, he rose again, and he went to heaven. Forty years later, after Jesus goes to heaven, the Romans destroy the city of Jerusalem, wipe it clean, destroy the temple, throw the blocks down. There's never been a temple since then in Jerusalem to this very day. <clears throat> so the question is asked now, when does this 70 week of years begin? He says, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem in verse 25. We know when that happened. In fact... We know. The permission by the Persians to rebuild the city was given to Nehemiah from Artaxerxes on March 14, 445 B.C., registered in stone. That decree is in stone to this very day. So start counting. 69 weeks. Sir Robert Anderson, a theologian of England, figured this all out. It put in leap years, 
put in uh, all the leap years and all the various variations. And there are 1,000 or 173,740 days to fulfill 69 weeks of years. So, Artaxerxes started it on that day, and guess when it ended? April 6, 32 AD. And what is Jesus saying? If you had known in this day, even you, even you would have known this. You could have read the book of Daniel and you would have known this. That I came into Jerusalem on exactly the same day that was written by Daniel 500 years earlier. We don't even have, can't even tell the weather the next day. We're supposed to have a lot of rain last night, and I was waiting for the rain. And all I got was a mist. Here we have God predicting to the day when the Messiah would walk into Jerusalem. Even Luke says in 19 verse 43 to 44, For the days will come upon you when your enemy will throw up a barricade, surround you, hem you in on every side, and will level you, level you to the ground, and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone Upon another. Why? Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You know what I'm saying? Just from this. Is this a triumphal entry or not? Yes, it is in one way. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. One way it's not because it meant the destruction of Jerusalem. You know something else? The 70th day is not included. There's a seven year period that's not included in this prophecy. If all the 69 have been fulfilled to the letter of the law, to the day, what about that 70th year? What's going to happen then? You want to know what's going to happen? Read Revelation chapter 6 through 19, which describes this Weak to a T. Still to come. So this, re so this celebration of the Palm Sunday, so to speak, because they threw palm leaves on the path. I think if we need to recognize that the Lord is coming. And for you and I who know Jesus Christ, it's called the coming of Jesus for the church, a Latin word which has been translated into English called the rapture. And we are the church which was started on Pentecost and will go to the day when Jesus Christ comes for the church. Then Jesus, then God, We'll say, okay, Israel, got to do some work in Israel. You need to repent of your sin and rejection of me. And I'm going to judge you, Israel, and I'm going to judge the Gentiles who have rejected Israel. Remember Habakkuk? How can you use an evil nation to judge a nation you chose? You're too holy. And what does God say? I'll judge them. I will judge Babylon for what they've done to Israel. And they were judged. When Daniel wrote his prophecy, he was already in Persia. Is this a triumphal entry for you or not? People are mourning what's going on in our country, and rightly so. The decline has been unbelievable. I was telling a Sunday school class earlier that just a couple of years ago, 17% of Americans called themselves Christians. That has dropped to half. 
Why? We're in the last days, folks. Apostasy is coming if it's not already here. These are the last days. You think it's going to get better? you got the wrong kind of glasses on. As I read my Bible, it gets what? Worse. Get yourself into this book and anchor yourself. Two years ago or three years ago, 4,780 some people lost their lives because they were Christians in one year. One year. They didn't have a trial. They were not, they were detained without a trial and they were killed without a trial. It's more even now. We are living in perilous times and you know, I want to say something. We can be thankful we live in the United States of America where we still have this freedom but it's ebbing away from us. It's ebbing away from us. Wake up, believer. Get yourself into this book and tell people you got time yet to place your faith in Christ. You got time now. But one of these days, it's going to be over. In the twinkling of an eye. Let us stand for prayer. Father, we are shocked how fast things are changing in our own nation, but we, we shouldn't be. Lord, we know the word should be alert to the fact that the day is coming, Father, when you're going to end it all. You're going to take the church, the true church, out of here. And Father, things are getting to the point where we are seeing... Uh, the strength of our land, the prosperity of our land, the freedom of our land being taken away from us slowly but surely and maybe even quicker than we think. So Father, we pray for our government. We pray for the believers in our government and that our government would stand by your word instead of by nothing and making good evil and evil good. Revive us, Lord. Revive the people of America to share their faith, to live for you. That you might hold off because of our belief. And so, Father, we pray for each individual here. That they may know you as their personal Savior. Your word stands sure. Even as Daniel predicted, 500 years before Christ the very day through your angel Gabriel. And he also predicted the end of our age in that 70th week. That prophecy still stands. And if there's any here who do not know Christ as their Savior, Father, we pray they would bow the neck and repent of their sin and place their faith in Christ. And if there are believers here who are not walking with you but ignoring what you're saying, and not fellowshipping with believers and being encouraged, we pray they would repent. And they'd come and walk with you. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.